If you're in the arts, quite possibly like me, you had a terrible math teacher who made you de decide that you go into the opposite direction. Uh, probably a bad science teacher as well. If you're in the sciences, it may be quite possible the inverse happened, that you had a terrible art teacher, or maybe hardly any art education at all, the way art is being cut out of our schools. Somebody may have convinced you, I'm not creative because I can't draw, and so on. Well, this is not true at all. In fact, I find out through my years of education that all of us have the ability to bo do both. And Buckminster Fuller called this process degeniusing. In other words, every single one of us has a genius inside of them. And once we enter into the education system, the education system works to degenius or reduce our focus or a perspective of what we see. So to understand the role of mathematics becomes really critical because this is actually in fact the way we operate in our world but at the same time are separated from certain operations of the world. Um, let's start by taking a look at why it's important and then we'll start with zero. I should also mention that I am picking just a few important points in the history of mathematics and in general concept of mathematics in relation to art. This is a huge field that could take a lifetime or at least a course. Uh, we're just tapping into it a little bit, so we're going to look at zero, perspective, golden ratio, Einstein's theory in relation to 3D, 4D, 5D, uh, how this influenced artists, and then of course computers, and finally end with fractals, which couldn't have been shown to us without the computing crunching powers of the computers. So let's go take a look. Mathematics is the study of relationship of numbers operations, interrelations, combinations, generalizations, abstractions, shapes, forms, spaces, structures, measurements, transformations, generalizations. It is using signs, symbols, proofs, arithmetics, al algebra, calculus, geometry, trigonometry. It is calculations. It is basically a system of symbols and rules of organizing them. It is a language. And it is really critical in the study of visual art, even though artists like myself have been removed from mathematics when we started studying art. But if you think of the importance of regular and irregular shapes, the circles, ovals, polygons, forms like spheres, polyhedrons. And able to, if you want to draw, paint, or sculpt these forms, sometimes you may want to use mathematical formula to calculate or measure dimensions, areas, or volumes. And if you don't know how to do that, then you just have to kind of fake it or estimate it or ask someone else to do it for you. Um, but all of this is just to point us to think about how socially relevant our knowledge or no knowledge of mathematics is. My favorite way to start off thinking about how to contextualize the social and historical aspects of mathematics is zero because it really has a fantastic his history and I would like you to take a look at a couple of books that are related to this subject. I will show you at the end of this um, talk. So we start with all the way back into the days of the Babylonians when they wrote on tablets of unbaked clay using cuneiform writing. So they pressed these the, these symbols into these uh, tablets with a stylus. And in about 400 BC, it was found that they would put these two wedge symbols into the place where we would now put a zero. Or 
to indicate a space. It was not only a notation, but it was really meant to move towards an empty space. So it's not quite a zero yet, but it's some type of punctuation mark so that the numbers have the correct interpretation. At least this is how we understand it now. Where zero as an empty place indicator uh, was moving to be used as an actual number in the calculations was really with the Greeks. Zero as a number finally appeared around 650 AD in Indian mathematics with the famous Indian mathematician Brahma Gupta who came up with his rules for arithmetic that had zero and negative numbers. He explained that if a given number, if you subtract it from itself, you get a zero. This is a huge concept. It is actually a paradigm shift, what we talked about earlier, because that moment and accepting that idea shifts the entire way that you look at not only mathematics and calculations, but in general, the perception of the world we live in. And these Indian ideas, or in the ideas from India, from Brahma Gupta, spread east to China, and then west to Islamic countries, um, we're talking about 1200s now, when Chinese mathematicians were writing this symbol for zero. Uh, it was not until the late 1200s that it appeared in the West. In fact, zero tried and made attempts to appear into the Western way of calculating and mathematics for a long time, but somehow was not able to penetrate into the consciousness, mostly because it really messed up their books. Let's put it that way, in a simple way. Um, in the West, there was Fibonacci, who was the main person bringing this together. He was the one describing the nine Indian symbols, and he is the person that we're actually crediting for bringing zero into the symbology of uh, mathematics. Zero at one point was considered the devil in um, European history, but that's another whole story. Maybe if you get interested, you can read about zero, and there's also a video that I recommend for you to watch. Just to end this whole um, story about zero in our times, year 2000 was the Y2K problem, which some of you may remember, actually was caused by a zero. So many people around the world celebrated the new millennium on January 1, 2000. Of course, they celebrated the passing of only 1999 years when the calendar was set up, there was no zero. So it started at one. <laughs> they actually made an error. And most people were afraid that when that flips, all the computers are going to go crazy. A lot of people made money with programs that were going to avoid that, but it all was okay. We're here in 2012. And zero is still causing us problems. Now we're doing perspective. Um, soon after zero was introduced in the West, we also see the introduction of one-point perspective and attempts being made to portray three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional canvas. Even the ideas of perspective came to us from the East that were there for much longer before they arrived to the West. Perspective is uh, really derived from El Haytham, who was a genius in optics, and we'll come back to him in a minute. 
If we look at the Western ideas of perspective, it was starting to happen in 13th century when Giotto painted scenes in which he was able to create impressions of depth by inclining the lines above eye level downwards as they moved away from the observer. Lines below eye level were inclined upwards as they moved away from the observer and then left and right towards the center. This was not in any way a precise mathematical formulation, probably derived by intuition or maybe hearing some ideas. Uh, but he came pretty close to an understanding of linear perspective. Um, the person who actually made or who is credited in the West, I should stress, with the first correct formulation of linear perspective is Bruno Leschi, who made this discovery of a single vanishing point rule in 1413. So we're talking a few hundred years after Al-Haytham. He understood that there should be a single vanishing point to which all parallel lines in a plane converge. Also important was his understanding of scale, and he correctly computed the relation of length of an object and the length of the picture, depending on its distance behind the plane of a canvas using mathematical principle. This is the way artists worked in the past. Um, so this way, Brunelleschi controlled precisely the position of the spectator so that the geometry was guaranteed to be correct. I mentioned earlier Al Haytham who is a medieval Muslim scholar known in the West as Al-Hazan and lived until 1040 AD. His book of optics was hugely influential on Renaissance artists three, four hundred years later. Um, the book of optics is really a landmark in the history of optics and um, was transforming the way in which light and vision was understood. It was also the foundation of modern physical optics and really important because it was also foundation to the idea of the scientific method. So he has been called, in fact, the founder of modern scientific method. And you can see how somebody like him would have a huge influence on art and how artists like Brunelleschi were influenced. Brunelleschi was trained in the principles of geometry and surveying methods. And so it is assumed that he used instruments to survey buildings and drawings of, uh, and he made drawings of ancient structures of Rome. In this way, in connection to some of the uh, optics and mathematics that he learned about, you can see how he understood the mathematical rules involving the vanishing point. Even though he was the first one to use these ideas, Alberti was the first one to write down the explanation of how these rules of perspective work on his famous treatise called On Painting. What I find, and many scholars find really interesting to note, is that he wrote two treatises on painting. One written in Latin in 1435, entitled De Pectura, and the second was written in lay Italian the following year, De La Pittura. These books are not only translated uh, in different languages, but he really wanted to address different audiences. He wanted to have this knowledge that was very technical in Latin, addressing the general audience as well, which really contributed to a whole other era of understanding of mathematics and perspective in particular. So in that treatise, 
He gives a background on the principles of, principles of geometry, the science of optics, which he learned from Al Haytham, and then sets up a system of triangles between the eye and the object viewed, which define the visual pyramid. Um, one of the most famous examples used in, by Alberti was a floor covered with square tiles. Um, this is a, a picture that's used many times in art historical books, and a lot of times without mention to the importance of the perspective of the tiled floor. So you see the center point of the perspective, the edges which are perpendicular, and that converge to the centric point of the um, pavement. This paviento, or pavement, is a type of a Cartesian coordinate system that creates a grid to, create, uh, to obtain the correct shape of a circle. So again, what you're seeing here is art being used to teach and at the same time to dialogue with um, the scientific world. This was absolutely connected and there was no separation whatsoever. Another important work written by an Italian Renaissance artist in the middle of 15th century was by Piero della Francesca, who was really the leading artist in his period, but also a leading mathematician writing some of the most amazing mathematical texts. Um, he includes materials on arithmetic and algebra, sections in geometry, and it creates um, a really unusual book written in the style of a teaching text. Um, so Piero della Francesca illustrates his text with diagrams of solid figures drawn in perspective. Here's uh, how his book begins with the description of painting. Painting has three principal parts, which we say are drawing, proportion, and coloring. Drawing, we understand as meaning outlines and contours contained in thing. Proportion, we say in these outlines and contours position and proportion in their places. Coloring, we mean as giving colors as shown in the things. Light and dark, according to the light, makes them vary. Of these three parts, I intend to deal only with proportion, which we call perspective, mixing it in with some part of drawing, because without this perspective cannot be shown in action. Coloring we shall leave out, and we shall deal with that in part, which can be shown by means of lines, angles, proportions, speaking of points, lines, surfaces, and bodies. So I would say that it is probably important to point out how in visual arts, Piero de la Francesca was really studying the geometry of vision. He talks about sight, the eye, the form of what is being seen, the distance from the eye to the thing seen, and the boundaries of the object and the eye, the intersection that comes between the eye and the thing seen, which is intended to record the objects. He begins by establishing geometric theorems in the style of Euclid, but like Euclid, he also gives numerical examples to illustrate them. And we cannot talk about the history of Renaissance in relation to mathematics without mentioning the one and only Leonardo da Vinci, whose early writings talks about perspective. Um, set out by Alberti and Piero della Francesca. Obviously, he was studying what these men have written before him. Perspective is a rational demonstration by which experience confirms that the images are all things transmitted to the eye by pyramidal lines, he writes. He developed mathematical formulas to compute relationship between distance and the eye 
to the object and its signs of intersecting plane. And not only did Leonardo study the geometry of perspective, but he also studied the optical principles of the eye in his attempts to create reality as seen by the eye. By 1490, he moved forward in his thinking about perspective and was one of the first people to study the converse problem of perspective. Given a picture drawn in correct linear perspective where the eye must be placed to see the correct perspective. So we look at Leonardo who distinguished two different types of perspective. There's the artificial, which was the way in which the painter projects onto the plane, uh, which could have been foreshortened by the observer and the natural, which reproduces faithfully the relative size of objects depending on their distance. In natural, Leonardo says that objects will be the same size if they lie on a circle. And then he looked at the compound perspective, where the natural perspective is combined with those produced as an angle. There's just no one um, that has fused mathematics and art in a single concept historically as Leonardo da Vinci did. And then from that point on, uh, it's very much the artists and mathematicians learning from each other. Uh, some that are worthy of mention in this brief overview is Dürer, from Germany in 1500s. He learned a lot from going to Italy, where he learned from first-hand math mathematicians. Um, he published a book in which he discusses the theory of shadows and perspective. And um, here are some of Dürer's shaded geometrical designs. He, he made a number of contributions to perspective in the 1500s, uh, describing mechanical aids that can be drawn for using perspective. And, um, and then it just continues from that point on to be just accepted as part of um, art making, not to mention architecture. Now we come to the golden ratio which is the ultimate connection of math and art. And we see it first appearing with the Egyptians. If you look at the pyramids of Egypt, they absolutely applied the theory of golden ratio. So what is it? The ratio was named the golden ratio by the Greeks. In the world of mathematics, the numeric value is phi, named for the Greek sculptor Phiadas. The space between the columns form golden triangles. These golden rectangles throughout structures are found in Athens, Greece, and in various sculptures. Phidias or Phidias used this ratio in his works of sculpture. A famous example of this is the Parthenon in Athens that was built in 440 BC. It is actually a perfect golden rectangle. Then we have Leonardo da Vinci, who we left off with perspective. If you look at the Mona Lisa, it is using the divine pers perspective, the divine ratio. The proportional relation ratio obtained by dividing a line so that the shorter part is to the longer part as the longer part is to the whole. Does that make sense? So you divide the line so that the shorter part is to the longer part as the longer part is to the whole. Another way to describe is a proportion between the two dimensions of a plane figure or the two di divisions of a line in which the ratio of the smaller to the larger is the same as the ratio of the larger to the whole. We see this applied to the upright L sides of the proportion, golden mean or golden section, they're called. There are specific 
mathematical relationships and they're distinctive in which the taller part divides in the height of the building, in this case, the Parthenon. The golden mean also is shown to produce a harmonic effect called eurythmy that's found in nature as well as in many works of art and design. And artists from numerous periods and cultures have found these dimensions aesthetically appealing. Let's take a look at one example of how golden mean, one drawing influenced so much in 20th century art and architecture. We're looking at the Vitruvian Man by Leonardo da Vinci. This was a drawing that was created in 1487, and it is accompanied on top and bottom by work of a famed architect, Vitruvius. Uh, it's a pen and ink drawing that shows a male figure in two superimposed positions with arms and legs apart that are inscribed in a circle and a square. And it is used many times as a symbol and icon of art and science. Um, the drawing is based on the ideal of human proportions uh, geometrically described by the architect Vitruvius. So it could be considered a collaboration as well. They worked together on this. Uh, Vitruvius described the human figure as the source of proportion for um, classical proportions of, in architecture. So what this, the title of this drawing, Vitruvius, is actually in honor of this architect uh, that Leonardo did. Let's take a look at how much influence this drawing and thinking of the human proportion in relation to architecture uh, has influenced artists and architects in the 20th century. We start with a, just a very, very few examples. You can see quite a few, but the first one I'll talk about is Mondrian in the 30s. Piet Mondrian was a Dutch artist who lived until 1944, and he moved to an abstract style of work He's very famous um, for using horizontal lines in many of his drawings and paintings. And he very much believed uh, in mathematics and simple geometrical shapes, primary colors that could be used to express reality and nature and logic from a different point of view. In, in the 30s, this was absolutely a revolutionary point of view to think that any shape is possible to create with basic geometric shapes in different combinations. And you can see the golden rectangle as one of the basic shapes appearing repeatedly in his art. When we move to architecture, we can take a look as a famous example, the work of the architect Le Corbusier uh, from France who used, uh, in this example that I'm showing you, he used uh, the golden ratio in his modular system, a, a very influential system that to this day is referred to by contemporary architects um, dealing with scale and architectural proportion. He directly talked about the tradition, continuing the tradition of Vitruvius um, referred to the Vitruvian man, made his own drawings, variations of that, and really believed in using the proportions of the human body to improve the appearance and function of architecture. Um, in addition to golden ratio, he also used uh, the Fibonacci numbers. Um, he was very much looking at Leonardo's suggestion of golden ratio and human proportions, dividing, subdividing those sections at uh, different parts of the body for his system. 
So this, uh, these are two examples where you can see how artists and architects were looking at the human body in relation to geometry, in relation to the space uh, we reside in, including architecture. Now we move to a more recent um, variation of looking at the Da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. Uh, 2003, a bestseller book came out that was made into a movie called The Da Vinci Code, which specifically refers to uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. Um, it's a murder victim found in the Grand Gallery of Louvre. He was naked and found posed like Leonardo da Vinci's drawing. And then he had a cryptic message that was um, the police had to look through and find out actually that it had something to do with the Fibonacci sequence that was left as a secret code. So this is um, a, an example of literature moving into a movie that became bestseller both as a movie and, and uh, as a book, uh, very much introducing or reintroducing these same concepts to the um, general public. If we look at uh, popular culture further, uh, we can take a look at television. There was a show that lasted for about uh, five years until 2010 uh, called Numbers. And in the first uh, season, there is an episode uh, called Sabotage in which the math genius Charlie, who is the main protagonist in this television series, mentions that the golden ratio is found in the pyramids of Giza and the Parthenon, and he uses many different mathematical uh, formulas to help his brother, who is an FBI special agent, to solve crimes for the FBI. Uh, right around that time, or a little before, in 1998, a movie that you will look at a clip of and hopefully get inspired to see the entire movie, is Pi, which uh, came out in 1998, which is um, based, uh, obviously, on the Pi number, uh, but it's a psychological thriller. So what we're seeing in this movie is Max Cohen, who is the protagonist and the narrator, thinking that and believing that everything in nature can be understood through numbers. And he also suffers from these heavy headaches, paranoias. Um, he starts making all kinds of predictions based on his calculations and working very closely with his computer, Euclid, which again refers to our historical ideas. In the middle of um, this uh, movie, you see how Euclid crashes and starts uh, th throwing out this um, random 216-digit number, which we now know is the golden mean number. So the entire movie centers around this. It's beautifully done. I highly recommend it. Uh, take a look at this clip, and then we'll take a look at um, some of the contemporary artists who work with mathematics.